Lepo pozdravljeni v naši naslednji vdaj Evropa je doma, tokrat se bomo s tujimi gosti pogovarjali o svobodi medijev v Sloveniji in ker imamo tuje goste, bomo preklopili na angleščino, za kar samo pravičujem, da vodi bodo na voljo pozneje. So, um, hello to everyone, especially to my guests today in Europe at home, um, emission live on our channels, on social media, discussing a very hot um, issue and very timely issue about the freedom of uh, media. Although uh, journalism looks a very uh, safe um, profession these days, um, it's absolutely not the case, not only that we have every year around 80 journalists killed and around 40 are imprisoned, of, uh, 400 are imprisoned of doing their jobs. The thing is that, um, especially in a COVID pandemic, and with online media, the journalists are increasingly under different threats. And I would say that it's also a perfect excuse for the governments to take control. There is, in a way, a new paradox today that uh, we should be very cautious about it, that uh, the governments in uh, some countries, and I would say Hungary, Poland, it's, uh, Slovenia is not far away from it, are at the same time guarding and owning uh, the media. And um, I have uh, three guests officially announced. I would introduce them. Erwin Hladnik Milharčić is a very well reputed uh, Slovenian journalist, writer, translator, former correspondent from Middle East and US, and the recipient of many journalist awards. Thank you for being with us. And Radka Becheva, um, head of member relations Central and Eastern Europe at European Broadcast Union. And uh, Olaf Stinfat heads the Media Ownership Monitor project and the Journalism Trust Initiative at the Press Freedom Watchdog Reporters Without Borders. And unofficially um, joined us um, on my um, 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 plea this morning, also the member of the Cabinet of Vice President of the European Commission, um, um, Vera Jourova, uh, Ms. Marie Frine. So thank you uh, for being with us also for a statement at a later stage. Now we have a lot of issues to discuss in a very limited time of one hour. Um, how we see the development in Slovenia. Um, and I would also um, use the opportunity to ask all that are watching us to put some questions to our speakers and I will pass them that they will um, try to respond. Now, um, we are confronted, as I mentioned, with misuse of information, with the rise of fake news, with populism, hate speech. Uh, but even what is most worrying is that we are facing direct threats from the government um, to journalists and open, very hostile attitude towards certain media, notably in Slovenia, towards a public um, national broadcaster. And uh, the party um, media from SDS has come to the fore running entire campaigns to discredit the journalists. So my question would go first to Erwin, who knows Slovenia media landscape very well. How much the journalism in Slovenia is threatened? Well, if you're talking about journalists, uh, it's, I, I wouldn't say that uh, the independence of the, the journalist class is, uh, is, is threatened on an individual level. I mean, what, what journalists in Slovenia do uh, is what journalists everywhere do. I mean, we, do, we, we search for facts and report the stories. And uh, this, we call ourselves journalists. I mean, people who do this, we are the journalists. And uh, um, on the other side, you have uh, people who write and uh, uh, pretend to be journalists and basically uh, uh, adapt facts to the needs of, uh, of uh, political parties and they peddle journalism as propaganda. There are these two sides. What is new now, and sort of there has been tension between uh, the political ambitions to control the message of, of, of the media. It, it, it has all been, he, been here and present. Now, the, the new situation is that in the same week that we got the pandemics, we got a right-wing government led by a party that was most radical in these conditions, and then we had an earthquake uh, on top of everything. So uh, we were going through a month 
even more than a month, that was really hilarious. On one side, you had the paranoia of everybody that were going, all going to die, and there was all the priorities were somehow subjected to the idea of uh, physical survival. On the other side, you had a frontal attack on journalism as a... a as a class of, of working people by the government uh, on, on two fronts. One, uh, an attempt to discredit completely any independent critique of the government and, and sell it as propaganda. On the other side, a direct institutional intervention into all the media that are in any way connected to the state. I'm talking about the public media or media and public ownership. So uh, the, the two boards regulating the work of the public broadcaster were all, all, all the members that could be removed and replaced by hard party hacks uh, were removed and replaced. And there was immediate pressure on the the, the 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 public broadcaster to function as the mouthpiece of the government. And this happened in a couple of days, and uh, uh, the the TV station that is owned by the national uh, telecommunications company, which is still state owned, the editor was also immediately replaced by uh, a journalist that basically functions as an employee and uh, changed the, 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 the structure of the program according to party lines. But on the other side, you have a, a vast panorama of journalists that uh, resist and do their job without uh, taking uh, the government into account as an editorial board. But I think generally, uh, I think the ambition of, of the government is to function as the editorial board of all the media in the country. And that, that's the goal. And, and they're working very hard and very successfully, I must say, with admiration in achieving this goal. But the resistance is also here. And uh, it's not uh, the pledge. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned yourself uh, the interference on the public. I hope you hear me because my yes, we we do hear, we do hear. Erwin. Is somehow frozen. It's um, no, we do hear you. But um, um, as you gave a good starting point also on the national public broadcaster, and you mentioned all the appointments in the recent, um, just basically yesterday in the program board of the TV, and recently also in the. Um, control board, uh, I would go directly to Ratka because you are following public broadcasters very closely in our region. It clearly shows that um, the biggest uh, coalition party here wants to take control over the public broadcasters and this is happening. And it's not the first case in Slovenia. So you wrote also a letter warning what is happening with the public broadcaster. What can you, did you get, a, did you get, get some reaction from Slovenia authorities. Indeed, uh, Tanya, we uh, we are uh, following very closely the developments in the Slovenian radio television because RTV Slo is a very valuable member of the EBU. And um, actually, right now, in these difficult times, we see more than ever public service media recognized uh, hitting records um, numbers of audiences and people trust uh, a public service media and go to public service media to to get uh, verified and trusted information uh, and uh, RTV slow is uh, doing uh, a tremendous efforts to answer to all now new uh, circumstances to all new needs and uh, requirements but by the audience they have launched uh, um, education on, on their channels uh, uh, there is an increase on um, on the news and current affairs content this this are, i mean we take it for granted but for every broadcaster working now in these constraints and limitations uh, it is a big effort and now uh, if these efforts are accompanied by uh, by political pressure this is too much for uh, for public service media of course we have reacted we have reacted uh, 
uh, and put a statement uh, by our uh, supported also by our director general uh, on our web page uh, where we uh, we express concern about undue political pressure and interference because uh, I think that now more than ever uh, public service media should be independent in in their job and journalists should be able to do their their job because people uh, now need not only help but they need also information about uh, the health conditions in in every mm-hmm. country. Uh, we have also uh, supported an alert on the Council of Europe uh, platform for protection of journalists and uh, mm-hmm. freedom of media, and pluralism of media. And uh, um, the, the reply was, I would, I would, uh, I mean, we were surprised with the reply. Let's let's put it like mm-hmm. this, uh, coming from the from the authorities. Uh, uh, but what I would really uh, like to underline is that. Uh, the public service media values, uh, which were unanimously adopted in Strasbourg in uh, uh, 2013 by all EBU members, uh, and which are independence, uh, universality, diversity, excellence, uh, accountability, um, and innovation. These these values we have to really uh, support public service media to, to be able to uh, to provide uh, the the best uh, content now uh, according to these values. I mean, the fact is, uh, what we all see that only in few weeks um, we got a lot of international letters of concern when it comes to the press freedom in Slovenia. Um, just now I read also the statement from Deputy Director of International Press Institute, Scott Griffin, saying that Slovenia is an example where government is verbally attacking um, journalists and it's rising concern about more and more these kinds of attacks happening. Um, that journalism is really in danger and we um, and all of um, your organization, uh, Reporters Without Borders, together with six other international organizations for freedom of media, um, send a letter to different EU institutions. We got it also in the European Parliament, I think also in the cabinet of uh, Commissioner Jourova, also our Minister Hoys got it, um, expressing concerns about the attack on journalism, concretely on the journalists here, um, Blažas Gaga, did you get all of a reaction or how do you see the situation in Slovenia? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for having me on this particular topic, I think at a timely moment. Um, uh, I must tell you that we have a kind of an internal saying at RSF that goes like, tell me what your media landscape looks like and I tell you what country you live in. That is to say, um, journalism as a profession usually serves as a canary in a coal mine. So if you see increasing attacks on journalists and a slide um, of performance and crackdown on the journalism profession, it usually indicates a decline of democratic values institutions at a larger scale. So this is kind of a a, a rule of thumb, I think, which uh, we see unfolding in in many, many ways. And sadly, obviously, at this moment in time, also in in Slovenia. Now, um, I think, as it is the case in many, many parts of of societies and economies, the pandemic now puts um, almost everything uh, under a stress test. Um, and this is definitely also um, the case for, for journalism. I think at an individual level, all of us experience right now that COVID, br- COVID brings out the best in people and the worst. And I think it also brings out the best and the worst out um, in governments. And obviously there are no surprises. So you see the usual suspects just capitalizing on the emergency situation in their grab of power. Um, And we don't have to travel far. It is happening inside the European uh, community of of states and values at this moment in time. And this is, I think, also uh, bringing up um, a a number of questions. And um, in the case of Slovenia, I must say that obviously we see um, smear campaigns and individual attacks Um, for example, on our own correspondent in the country, but also at a larger scale when it comes to the institutional um, footing of our profession of journalism and the institutions uh, related to it. 
and maybe let me just um, add another observation related to to the pandemic, which I find really ironic. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, on the one hand, you see um, the increasing demand for authoritative information during an emergency and an increased new trust in institutions, including media, which is great. Um, on the other hand, you see journalists being deployed to the front lines, also putting themselves in danger in reporting about the pandemic, while the economic um, business model just folds and collapses totally as advertising revenues um, disintegrate and, and funding, which already was a problem before the pandemic, uh, and many, many media outlets operating on the the, the cliff edge of bankruptcy are now pushed further over it. And this is kind of an irony I think we have to face collectively. Um, and that would be now um, my question uh, to um, the member of the cabinet of the commission, because we are all aware that um, online violence can lead to the offline violence. Uh, we saw cases of uh, journalists being murdered in Malta, in Slovakia, where, where that all can also lead. Or, um, I know that uh, you received um, warning letters from Slovenia, and um, uh, my understanding is that uh, Vice President Jurova um, got in touch with Slovenian authorities. So what are the further steps? how the EU or the Commission can help. I know there will be the rule of law report evaluating each member state in autumn. So what are you discussing in the Cabinet, in the Commission? Yes, thank you very much first for, for uh, the invitation and the uh, useful contributions. I mean, we are really in the Commission listening to all views. Um, so as Vice President Jehova said in her message on Friday, uh, free and independent media are key for, for democracies. And especially uh, in times of crisis, and this was said now, uh, journalists are in the front line to uh, report, to check facts, and all governments and politicians into account, sometimes putting their life uh, in danger. And we all have to do our best to support journalists to do their work. And we are also aware that government across the globe, they are taking uh, measures to fight the COVID-19 virus, but this cannot be done at the expense of press freedom and journalism needs to be safe and have access to information. And as uh, Vice President Jehova said in the past, uh, including at her hearing at the European Parliament, I mean, the protection and the safety of journalists should be a priority for every country. And this is indeed an element that the Commission uh, is looking at as part of the rule of law mechanism report. And there is a public consultation ongoing, and I invite all, uh, all of you and all stakeholders to participate. Um, let me also mention that thanks to the support of the European Parliament, uh, the Commission is also confunding projects to map threats and risk to media uh, freedom and pluralism, to support investigative journalism, and also to provide legal aid uh, and assistance to journalists. And um, we are also very well aware that uh, media face an economic crisis. So, and it, this crisis was there before. So, the crisis uh, in now COVID nineteen is amplifying a lot of pre existing trends. And um, we are also aware that small local media, the closest to the citizens, are at special risk. And so member states, they have the tools with the support of the Commission to help the media sector in the respect of uh, media independence. And we are also looking at the media sector as part of the European recovery package. And more specifically, when it comes to Slovenia, I can confirm that uh, com the Commission has taken contact with, uh, with the relevant Slovenian authorities to discuss uh, the importance of freedom uh, of expression, of media freedom, of safety of journalists, the protection of journalists, as well as support to the media sector in those uh, challenging times. So this is ongoing, contact is ongoing. And uh, once again, we are open to, to dialogue and uh, to listening to all views. So thank you. Thank you. And I can confirm that we have very good uh, contacts also within the institutions as the European Parliament is 
very much concerned about the free, independent, and sufficiently funded media that we are all aware it's very necessary. And recently, we just um, issued a call, our culture committee, to the European Commission also to look into creating an emergency fund for the media and press. And you already gave some indications on that. This will be uh, very crucial because also the worsening financial situation is something that could um, harm massively, especially smaller media. But I would come back to, to the situation in Slovenia, uh, what very much upset was or divided um, our citizens and media here was a, a governmental document sent to Council of Europe. We touched a little bit that presented in a very biased way, I would say, um, the situation of media in Slovenia. And the Minister for Interior, uh, who is yesterday explained in the conference to his colleagues in Brussels uh, about the situation of uh, media, that the left-wing media are trying to stop the government in um, putting measures in place in fight against pandemic um, in Slovenia. So this is something... Um, that this document, non-governmental or governmental document that has been sent to the Council of Europe. Um, now there is a demand from the parliament that the foreign ministry withdraws it, but no one speaks anymore about that. So it was certainly a very harmful document um, that uh, the government in a way abused um, its uh, power. Erwin, how much damage is caused here in your eyes? And do you expect that the government will repair this mistake? I mean, come on, the situation is really hilarious. Uh, you know, you have the government of which at least half of the ministers, including the prime ministers, are act, uh, activists of the uh, vanished Communist Party of Yugoslavia, uh, accusing the journalists of having the, the, the media uh, being descendants of uh, communist publications. Uh, it is a fact that this country has been under a communist government since 1990, and, 1990, and then it wasn't. And the, 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 the media, of course, public media, uh, uh, continued to function as did uh, newspapers and other media. I mean, sort of, it's not that there was a break with the past and suddenly the population was changed. So you have ex-communist accusing the media of being as communist which uh, sounds like uh, one of uh, the jokes from Stalinist times. Uh, I don't think that this shouting, you know, you're a traitor, communist, whatever, has much effect on the work of journalists. I think one should focus and really be very precise in monitoring the institutional steps taken by the government in uh, uh, A, taking control of public media, which are uh, the strongest best bastion of uh, freedom of information in a in country because most of the people follow the world through public television. This, no, no matter what, what additional channels there are, that's the source of information. It's national radio and national TV. And if you put that under direct party control, you lose territory for uh, checking and the, 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 the facts. Uh, on the other side, uh, there's the economic uh, uh, pressure where basically the government in this party has a tradition of doing it, basically threatens uh, companies that have contracts with the government to withdraw ads uh, from, uh, from the media. And this uh, hits the newspapers. And I think... Uh, I mean, it's very easy to say that the European institutions are concerned, monitor, and whatnot. Uh, here there's a trap into which we have fallen a couple of times. Uh, not just in Slovenia, I think this is true for all the Eastern Europe, that we took membership in the European Union as a guarantee that we will not live under a crazy government anymore. These guarantees proved to be... Uh, imaginative. 
Yeah, I mean, so uh, basically, while on, on one side, yes, of course, any international monitoring is uh, uh, absolutely necessary and, uh, and precious, but uh, on the other side, one has to be conscious that the real fight is done inside the newsrooms uh, from day to day. And that has to be, I think, uh, that there, there should there, it, that should be supported. I think, in more uh, than uh, symbolic uh, gestures of sympathy instead of solidarity. And I think uh, this idea that uh, that you're not alone, uh, that you know you are part of a common problem that is not linked to one political party which is now in power, but that there is a general degeneration of respect for public information throughout the European Union. And uh, that skepticism towards journalism, it's not just a prerogative of authoritarian uh, governments, but that uh, democratic leaders elected with all the credentials feel the need to discredit journalists and use all the channels at the disposal of authorities to do it, that has to be checked and uh, I think sanctioned at all possible levels. I mean, mm -hmm. It's not just a question of, it's nice to hear sympathy, yeah, okay, you're doing a good job, uh, keep on fighting and so on. I mean, it, it's, it's not about the fight, it's about doing a job. I mean, sort of, it, it, this pandemic has shown that you have, since nobody yeah, that you expect would be the holder of the knowledge, which were scientific institutions. I mean, they, they had contradictory opinions about, uh, about the, the, the actual danger of the virus. So the, 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 the result is usually that everybody has an alternative opinion. Uh, sticking to facts and just noticing that there is a diversity of uh, um, opinion coming from a lack of scientific knowledge, which now I think has become quite clear, is, is enough for journalism. I mean, so if we express opinions about issues uh, where, where we know, uh, that, we, that, that we know. And uh, um, in, in this pandemic, uh, I think what, what has become clear is the same phenomenon that, that you see in, in in the field of, of ecology and global warming, that there is a tendency of equaling political statements with uh, uh, expert analysis. Like as, as the weight of an expert is the same as somebody who has a political opinion about what's going on. And I think the role of journalism is here to, 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 to separate uh, political opinions and and opinions in general from whatever you might gather of uh, scientific expertise. Mm -hmm. I think there has been a lot of work uh, uh, invested into this uh, under circumstances that are not favorable. I'm a reporter. I went to Venice when they canceled the carnival and, and I was alone there. I was, I was very happy, but there was very little to report. Expected that the Italians are just as afraid every, as everybody else to go out in the streets. In order to understand the situation, you need a level of expertise on which you can report. You cannot report on the opinions of everybody who has five minutes of time and it's inventing uh, a world of his own. But Erwin, how can you journalists among yourself being challenged today with so many different things we discussed protect yourself and your profession? Because I don't think you are also standing on the same footing. You have also different views, as you mentioned yourself. And well, you know, you, 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 you do what you can to protect yourself. I mean, you, you, I mean the doctor didn't tell me to be a journalist. So uh, uh, he would probably tell me not to do it. But you know, journalism is a, is a profession when on certain, certain times you, you, you take risks, not a necessary one, but the necessary risk you take uh, in order to, uh, to inform your public 
about uh, uh, how you see the situation and what you can witness. I mean, this this is our job, basically. And uh, uh, the question of, I mean, what has to be protected is the respect for the profession that sticks to facts and doesn't peddle inventions and political fantasies as... Uh, as mm -hmm. I mean, and I said, there's a lot of that. There's also, and, but at the same time, all the mistakes I think that could be made were made in this month. Mm. So there was, I mean, yeah, sorry. There was complete confusion, I mean, among uh, heads of states who were inventing cures for a pandemic they didn't understand. And uh, uh, so I think what what our job is, is just to separate, you know, political strategies and uh, the fashionable opinions from uh, uh, sources of information that have validity. And this this is what, uh, if, yeah. if, if this can be done, then it's, and this has to be protected on the institutional level because what you have to protect is the independence of ed editorial policies, uh, uh, editorial competence and uh, journalistic practices that are based yeah. on... And this is, uh, this is absolutely the, the um, responsibility of the institutions and national governments. Um, for example, if you look just um, to our neighboring country, Hungary, in times of pandemic, um, coronavirus law passed with penalties of up to five years in prison for false information with which was a completely disproportionate and coercive measure from the government of Orban. Now, in Hungary today, we have media capture process that have advanced really very far. 80 percentage is today's data published of all the media is in the hands of the government and its allies. And emergency laws cannot be challenged by the parliament and media, which is additionally very worrisome. And the fear is that we will see that the power taken in the emergency law can become permanent, that laws can be retained, which is an enormous danger. We see this now happening in Turkey. In Poland, for example, we have soon elections, presidential elections, um, and public broadcaster is in the hand of the government, which is a threat to hold a free democratic elections. Now, Olaf, you are also part of Council of Europe, or the following the, the reports, uh, we are aware that the situation in media is deteriorating in Europe now for several years. There is an additional threat in pandemic also with disinformation and false news. Do you have some update? What can you do as your organization? Yes, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, I think in terms of response, um, it might be useful to look a bit more into the role of the European institutions and the EU, particularly as we have the Commission sitting at the table here. And also maybe um, um, kind of manage the expectations vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission and what it actually can do and it, what it can't. Um, I think what we've seen over time is that in many, many ways, Europe and the, uh, the Union is being built and designed for sunny weather. We saw this in, with the Eurozone and the financial crisis in 2008, so a lot of fixes had to be made. We saw this in the topic with the topic of migration, where, again, a lot of fixes are now being applied. And I think exactly the same is the case in terms of um, our health system, response to corona and the support and the role of journalists in journalism. Now, one big problem here is the Amsterdam Protocol, which basically stipulates that the competency in political terms for media policy is exclusively on the member states. And that gives you an idea why the... Let's say if we speak about carrot and sticks, there are not many sticks in the hand of European institutions to intervene in this field. I mean, they can issue nice statements and also maybe support as much as they could, but there is no real political leverage. And this is, I think, more and more becoming a problem if we are asking ourselves, is Europe really a club of values or is it only an economic block? And the only thing you can resort to is Article 7 as the nuclear option, but there's not much in between. And this is, I think, what now becomes, becomes obvious when we see um, 
journalism in decline um, and, and, and uh, amplified through the corona uh, epidemic. Um, when it comes to responses, I think um, it's, it's really important to disentangle the different types of threats we look at and the respective protection. Um, obviously, there is um, physical risk for journalists and they need physical protection. You cannot just say like, you know, prosecutors or judges in Italy chasing the mafia, it's up to them to protect themselves. They need official physical protection. The second level is legal risk which asks for legal protection. And if the legal system in a country is flawed, then of course it is the responsibility of the union um, to step in. Um, the third and I think more recent uh, level of risks is economic risk, which is um, also inhibiting freedom of expression and pluralism, as we all know, if you think of concentration of ownership and media capture. It's not the old school type of censorship where you, you know, send in your articles and people would, you know, cross out sentences. It happens mostly via self-censorship. If the owner of your newspaper is an oligarch, you don't have to receive a call as an editor or a journalist to tell you what to write or not to write. It happens automatically. This is a trend and this needs responses on the economic level, on the question of sustainability. And last not least, the fourth level of risk and also protection is the technological one. Um, in our digital age, if we look at smear campaigns, they are driven by digital technology. They would not have worked the way they do today, 50 years ago. Um, and if you think of surveillance and many, many other instruments and tools being implied, applied to, to threaten journalists and to, to limit their, their capabilities and their freedoms, um, this is a huge amount of risk. And obviously, as this type of technology doesn't respect any borders. It needs um, a collective multilateral response. And this is, again, um, um, where I'm looking at the European Commission and beyond. And particularly, I must say, at the European Commission, because these days, if you talk to people in the US, they are looking at us. They know that the United States under the Trump administration will do nothing. If it's not Europe fixing these things and moving ahead, um, nobody will do it. Hmm. I mean, today, yes, I see that uh, obviously Marie was um, uh, too often somehow um, not provoked, but mentioned as what can commission do. So please, Marie, I see that you want to react. You have to unmute your, your yes, mic. indeed. I'm sorry, I was I was no doing problem. it. No, indeed. I mean, all very relevant issues, and we are uh, looking at all this. I mentioned already the rule of law um, report, and also we will publish by the end of the year the European Democracy Action Plan. And actually, right now, now 12:30, uh, my vice president, Vice President Jourova, is in the press room uh, of the European Commission. Uh, live right now to give the readout of the college. So I'm, I'm sorry, there are competing events right now, but uh, you will also be able to listen to her because I'm, I'm sure that all the questions that you are, I mean, that have been asked right now, she is being asked now in the press room of the European Commission. And of course, it's better to hear from her than from me. So um, I'm sure that you can watch again the, the, the video, the, the press conference after this, this call. I will, help my, I will have myself to disconnect in a few minutes. Uh, but I uh, will also make sure that I, I, have, I have taken a lot of notes. And I will make sure that uh, we are also in touch that I get also the elements of the rest of the discussion because you, you still have a few minutes and you will still discuss things. So I will make sure that I can get uh, all the inputs and all this is extremely useful. And uh, I can reassure you once again that uh, Vice President Jehovah is following all this very closely. Um, thank so you very thank much. Thank you again. And thank you, uh, thank you, dear MEP, for organizing this and for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. And uh, we'll continue with um, um, our discussion. Uh, my question goes to Radka, as I know that European Broadcast Union recently published a report that explores the impact of the pandemic. Um, what is um, this impact having on the digital media consumption? What are the key findings of this report? 
thank you, Tanya. Be before I answer your question, I, I would actually like to uh, agree and support what all have said about uh, the instruments uh, for the Commission and still I see that Marie is still with us. Uh, I, I, I would agree that <clears throat> maybe now we really need uh, to, to get into more active phase where reports would maybe not enough, uh, because if we see that uh, we have indeed uh, uh, using the that many many governments in in, in Europe are uh, and it's predominantly in Central and Eastern Europe are using the pandemic to uh, to restrict freedom of expression and uh, free flow of information and uh, um, uh, introduce disproportionate uh, emergency measures or restrict access to information. We have seen a lot of uh, uh, changes into um, into the days to answer uh, free uh, re request to free, free access to uh, information from 30 to 60 days. Uh, and we we see verbal and physical attacks. We see also surveillance uh, and privacy threats. Uh, so I would say that maybe a report would now uh, we should move to a more active um, uh, um, phase where we would. Um, need maybe to introduce some new instruments. I don't know, I, I'm sure that the European Commission is looking into it, but some kind of a communication or something which would be more practical and which would have also kind of consequences. Because if we only acknowledge, even, even now I don't think that naming and shaming it works, uh, it even that doesn't work anymore. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I would really encourage the Commission to look at into more practical, concrete instruments which would look also at consequences for members who are not um, up to the values of, of our union. And uh, I think that um, we should be indeed now very careful because if we see Hungary, Poland, you mentioned Poland, but I would say also Romania, where you 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 just could close uh, websites uh, without a uh, right to appeal, or uh, in Bulgaria, my own country, they try to uh, uh, to introduce uh, uh, to change the the penal code. Code, thanks God, it uh, it was it did not uh, happen. But uh, also, uh, I think that uh, um, we have some uh, uh, even uh, very well established democracies uh, uh, where governments uh, in Spain or the, the government was under criticism for for press conferencing. Thanks God, I think that now this is settled. But uh, like that, journalists should be able to ask questions freely and to get uh, free uh, free information. Um, so I would uh, I would say that we indeed now need a more a broader platform and um, more active uh, measures and concrete measures. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the the report, I, I would say that uh, uh, as as I mentioned already, uh, public service media uh, now more than ever uh, shows its indispensable role. Uh, the report shows that the the, the numbers are. Uh, rocketing in, in all uh, our members, uh, including Slovenia, by the way, when you ask the question, uh, what is the harm? I think we should look actually at the figures and the figures show that uh, um, there, there is increased um, numbers of people who are, who are um, watching uh, and listening to public service media. Um, there is increased trust uh, in, in public service media. Um, and uh, uh, actually, we we should uh, now, after so many years, more than twenty years after the changes in in our part of the world, I think we should be far from state media, where the state controls, the state pays, and uh, media are responsible to the state. Now uh, we have a new paradigm where the people are paying for the public service media. The people uh, are the ones who uh, the public service media is accountable to and is responsible to, and uh, uh, the, the public service media serves the citizens and not uh, not uh, structures and uh, political parties and uh, political interests. Uh, so I would uh, I would say that this this is definitely the the data shows that public service media now. Uh, more than ever is trusted and watched and listened, and uh, people are actually our um, 
um, our argument because we serve the people and uh, the numbers shows, uh, show that uh, this is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Rasko. Olaf, um, you... Just a very quick footnote, as the Democracy Action Plan was mentioned earlier upcoming, um, we applaud it. Uh, we look very much forward to, to seeing it um, materialize. But let's not be mistaken, this is soft law. This will be a list of recommendations. This is the carrots part. The battleground uh, in the coming years will be the Digital Services Act, which will be hard law, which will be um, a, an EU directive to be ratified and put into national law with the member states. And we are a bit afraid that on the sticks part, on the hard law part, it might, or at least there's a danger that this Digital Services Act will in the end just result in an update of the EU services directive or e-commerce directive. Um, mainly looking at trade-related aspects of digital technology and fail to address uh, the larger picture and then kind of, you know, refer to the Democracy Action Plan, which has no legal leverage at member states whatsoever. Mm. And as uh, we fail to properly address, as we, I think, all agree, democracy, rule of law on certain countries, because we don't have proper instruments for it, except of Article 7. Now we are discussing about maybe cutting funds from the next EU budget to countries that don't respect European uh, values. We are also losing somehow freedom of media rapidly. Um, now, I would ask Erwin to come back to Slovenia because I know that our uh, people are very um, interested about after this pressure on public broadcaster take over control. What I see is that the public broadcaster is losing really its independence finally. Um, will next one be Slovene National Press Agency or maybe even your media Dnevnik because we saw already verbal attacks directly from the Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah, but formal verbal attacks are really no problem. I mean, the, the, you know, I work for a private media. We have our own strategies of protection for trade unions and uh, uh, journalist association, whatever. I mean, we fight as, as much as we can, and sometimes we lose, sometimes we win. The problem, the central problem, is actual, realistic protection of public broadcasters and journalism as a public service. These can be harmed permanently, uh, very seriously. You have the example of Greece when they have practically uh, uh, dismantled the, the, the public broadcaster overnight. And it's very difficult. One, you know, these are enormous monsters. I mean, sort of with the archaic structures, with sections where nobody knows what they do, and they look eternal. Once they are uh, decomposed, people just don't. Don't, nobody knows how this thing stood together. It's a very complex mechanism. And this has to be protected with uh, whatever instruments. Uh, since we were talking in the context of the European Union, uh, whatever European instruments are available, they should be directors towards this. If they are around, I mean, legal, whatever, uh, uh, through structural funds, whatever, they should be directed as requests for protection of the independence of uh, public broadcasters. And that, as far as Slovenia uh, 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 is concerned, then we, we have a few months of time. Hmm. It's very sort of once, uh, once a, a, a political party is very determined to, to, to uh, dismantle uh, any public service, it's usually very efficient at doing it and whatever effort is then make to recompose it uh, requests much more organization funds and perseverance than just smashing it up. And the, the public broadcaster in Slovenia is yes and no, it's, it's, under, it's under threat of becoming a state-controlled media. And few months of time is a very, very um, serious uh, warning. We've experienced, in fact, that in Hungary, if you look to the history, when Orban came in power, he, he started with the control of media. And today, as I said, they are around 80% in the hands of the government. So this is a serious control. 
and I fear that we are um, here experiencing the same methods. Also a section of the Slovenian media is under Hungarian control. Absolutely, and that I can remind us all that we in the parliament tried to have a debate. We had even a consensus just before pandemic to discuss about these money flows from Hungary to Slovenia to the media close to the governmental um, biggest party and also to North Macedonia. Um, I do hope we will discuss it after the pandemic when we get back. Um, maybe just my final question, because we are getting to the end slowly, but I think it's still very important. Now, in these times of pandemic, we see a really rapid increase of false news and disinformation. And uh, with your experience, how do you think people can really distinguish from false news? I mean, every day are also lots of new web pages um, open that are spreading this information, not only on COVID, but uh, of course, um, some other forces are abusing the crisis with spreading the fears among citizens too. So there are a lot of aspects that can be abused in this pandemic from false news, hate speech to somehow spread fear and control people. Now, what would be your advice to people when they try to follow media and get information? Uh, maybe Radka, you start. I, I would start with, because in the, in the EBU, uh, as, as you know, Tanya, we have a very valuable uh, Eurovision news exchange and uh, social uh, verification network. Uh, we we work. This, this is a service for all serv uh, for all public service media in Europe. So it includes BBC, RAI, RTV Slow. All our members are part of this uh, news exchange, and we have there a social verification network, which helps uh, really uh, our members uh, when when there are some stories uh, that they know uh, what is the source, is it trustful source, and. Uh, uh, and uh, also we are now um, leading again um, a trustful initiative. Uh, it's, uh, it's about, uh, again, uh, trustful resources and uh, trustful uh, information. Uh, and I think that we could, uh, uh, this would be the only uh, professional and journalistic way to uh, counter uh, this information and false information with really professional and trusted information because closing uh, um, websites and the limitations on, on internet, especially now in the time of the pandemic, I think would be absolutely counterproductive and counter our uh, our values in, in, in Europe where we so much cherish uh, freedom of expression. Thank you, Olaf, please. Yeah, maybe uh, three quick points from my end. First of all, I think there is a little bit of silver lining. Uh, first of all, what we currently see is really um, an increase of demand for authoritative news and people really turning to, um, I would say, um, trustworthy mainstream media to, to retrieve um, credible information. Um, by the way, not only because they are really interested in learning more, but also because, for example, sports broadcasts are no longer there. Premier football leagues are not, mm -hmm. you know, playing. So there's more television time shifting towards factual content, which is kind of interesting to, to, to watch. Um, the second point is about um, deleting or demoting uh, malicious uh, or harmful content, where we usually um, are a bit reluctant because it can easily lead to overblocking and a limitation of freedom uh, of expression, particularly um, if we ask ourselves who is in control. However, also what we currently see is when we were really struggling a lot to engage with the big tech companies before the pandemic about, you know, disinformation. Um, currently, uh, during Corona, we see that when they do want to do something, they can easily. So suddenly, there is a lot of potential really visible in the response of Facebook and Google and others, which was before the pandemic, really difficult to, to unleash. Um, the third point is a little bit of caution I would like to express on media literacy, which is always mentioned as the silver bullet, like we educate people better about using digital media and the harms associated with it. I sometimes feel that this is 
too easy because it's really like pushing the responsibility on the citizen. It's like saying, you know, uh, drinking water is toxic, but here are some testing strips and, you know, a colorful brochure. Please be safe. No, I think really creating a, si a safe um, information space is first and foremost the uh, responsibility of all stakeholders involved and not so much the end user. Mm, okay. Um, and for Erwin, I was thinking in the, in the meantime, um, talking about false news and disinformation, my question, which media in Slovenia to trust, um, I wouldn't ask which politicians, but media, or how you can counter with um, facts against false information and disinformation? How are you journalists organized to do so? Oh, that's, that's very easy. You know, if you ask yourself, why is the government so keen on taking control of public television and public radio? Uh, because when they have to communicate something dramatic during the pandemic, they go on public television. They have their own channels. You know, they have their own TV, they have party TV, whatnot. But they go on public television. Why? Because public television guarantees that it's a news environment. You go to, to, to a party on the uh, information channel, you know you're peddling propaganda. That's why you come on public television. Coming on public television opens the space for uncomfortable questions. So what did the government do? It invented a press conference without journalists, which I think should be noted down point, as yeah. a creative solution <laughs> <laughs> problem of, uh, uh, of information. So uh, um, I think that, uh, you know, distinguishing fake news from inventions, it's difficult for professional journalists. I spend some time every day trying to figure out what, what could be true in what passes through the same screen through which I'm talking to you. And, you know, and I'm, I have some experience with this business, I put it like this. Uh, and, and I have time to do it because it's my profession to distinguish this. Uh, I think the only way that, that you can have a space of sanity in, the, in this uh, uh, universe is creating and protecting news media that are capable of producing credibility. Public media, it's a very good place to start. And, uh, uh, and I, mean, see, I know that I'm repeating this uh, ad infinitum, but yeah, sure, I think if you don't protect public media, uh, all other channels of information will be uh, less informed and even less capable of distinguishing reality from fiction. I would um, like to thank you all. I think we got some very good messages out of our debate. Um, and by the way, this is your responsibility. You're a politician. It's my responsibility at the end of the day. I'm the only one that's speaking the name of, uh, or from the political point of view, being responsible myself. And uh, I do agree that to protect uh, public uh, mainstream media could, and it must be a, a proper start, which we experience just the opposite in Slovenia. And pandemic here is a perfect excuse for our government to push for repressive measures that threaten also the right for free um, reporting. Um, and I would just stress at the end that the protection of journalists should be a priority for every country. And it is um, our responsibility of all, and the journalism is in danger. We all said that numerous journalists were also fired for just trying to do their job in a, a right way. And, and Slovenia is a, also a very good example of government verbally attacking um, journalists. It's a growing concern, and I'm grateful to all of you that are bringing these concerns forward also uh, beyond Slovenian borders or so internationally, because sometimes this pressure from outside, it's uh, very important and very welcome that we can really try to keep to our values and see what we can do. So um, thank you. And I can come to, to the beginning saying that there is a paradox that governments in many countries are really um, trying to guard and own the media at the same time, and we should stop that. 
Um, have a nice rest of the afternoon, and I'm sure we will soon get in touch again. Thank, thank you, you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Let's stay safe.